hallelujah. Oh, yes, it is. God has worked it out on my behalf. My eyes may not see it. By faith, I receive it. It will manifest. It's already done. short Bible talks and uh, I am Joe Turner senior pastor teacher here at Matthews Memorial Baptist Church 
Uh, last week we were in uh, Romans chapter 13. We are steadily working our way through. Uh, we have uh, uh, a couple more chapters to go. I believe 15 and 16, correct? And uh, and then we would have made our way through the entire book of Romans. So last week we talked about our uh, our government uh, allegiance that we should have a uh, healthy respect for governor uh, governing leaders, uh, president, and all of our state local elected leaders national elected leaders and uh, we should have a healthy respect for the role that they play that the role that they play in government we also uh, talked about how we have an allegiance to a higher law so we have a responsibility to uh, the law of government and its role that it plays in our lives our civic affairs social affairs uh, but also we have to make sure that that law is in align with uh, the divine law or, or God's law that has been passed down to us. In addition to that, that uh, there in, herein is protest. <clears throat> well, we get a chance to protest and voice our displeasure with things that may be going on uh, in, our, in our society. So uh, we mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, we celebrated uh, his day, uh, day of celebration and day of service on last Monday, uh, just as a reminder that his very life was about uh, protesting and speaking up for uh, uh, equality uh, and for unity uh, and for equal rights <clears throat> and, uh, and economic equality as well. So, uh, so we ended of chapter 13 last week, and now we're in chapter 14, and this is about, uh, about uh, ethics and uh, annual days, uh, observing annual days, and we'll get to it. And he begins this first section with the, uh, the weak and the strong. And when I read this, I was, I was very surprised to know who was the weak and who were the strong or stronger. So here it is in chapter 14, verse 1 says, Accept those uh, whose faith is weak <clears throat> without quarreling and disputing matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but the other uh, whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Eats only vegetables. And, you know, I... I Upon first uh, glance at this, uh, you would think that those who did not have the discipline of eating only vegetables, or let's just say it this way, those who uh, had the discipline of restricting their diet, or uh, those who had uh, the discipline of uh, self-imposed rules, were the stronger. But upon reading this again, you discover that uh, one person allows them to eat anything, but the other, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. So I'm going to expand this conversation about the strong and the weak, and he follows it all out, uh, identifying special days, uh, holidays, or holy days, or even the Sabbath day. Uh, that he indicates that the one who eats vegetables is the one who follows self-imposed rules is the weakest. The one who has self-imposed rules, the one who has these restrictive and uh, all of these uh, self-imposed acts on their self is the weakest while the one who eats anything uh, is, is strongest. Because he, he gives the idea that self-imposed rules, and he uses the illustration of vegetables or vegetarian, vegan, and we use that word vegan, he uses that is because uh, the one who has self-imposed rules is not 
free. Because there is a sense in which that the rules they impose upon themselves equate to piety or, or somehow or another lifts their loyalty. And let me pause and talk about that for a moment because there are many people who may be involved in the act of fasting um, who lift the nobility of their fasting to others who may not fast as if that makes them a cut above the rest. And what we're going to see here is God accepts them all. I think I think that I think that would be so shocking and surprising to note that all of our acts of piety, you know, the people who who who, who will testify, they may the people who brag about how often they pray, how often they fast, about what they eat and what they don't eat, whether it is kosher food or not kosher food, uh, whether whatever it is. There is a sense in which we believe or have come to believe that the things that we do equate to piety or equate to our uh, religious nobility or religious connection to God. And what we're going to see later is all of these self-imposed rules only have external benefits. <laughs> And so he said, the person who has self-imposed rules, he uses vegetables as a as a as a uh, example. But what he's really saying is that the self-imposed rules that you have upon yourself does not equate to piety, and they only have external benefit. And what he says is, um, he's vegetable. Verse three: the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does this is the last clause verse 3 for god has accepted them i i, I think i think we'll be surprised at at all of the self imposed rules and even if we impose them for discipline's sake that's that's a that's beautiful. We should do that. But but don't think that because you're involved in religious um uh practices that somehow or another that makes you closer to God than everybody else. This this is talking about food, but he's really talking about uh our relationship. God accepts them both. That's what the last verse says. That God accepts them both and that the one who does not eat, don't argue with him, right? And how many discussions do we hear people have about what you eat and what you shouldn't eat and, you know, special days and the days that are not so special and the days that are more important than others. And, uh, and even in terms of fasting, even, even in terms of our uh, religious church attendance and, 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 out of anybody, I want everybody when we get a chance to come back to church to come to church. I mean, uh, who else other than the pastor wants people to show up to church? Uh, but we must we must draw that line to get people to uh, to understand based upon this word that it doesn't draw me closer to God because I come more often. <clears throat> right. He says, uh, people argue and they dispute over who eats everything or who eats nothing or who only eats vegetables. He says, the person who eats everything, he said, if you don't, don't judge them. <laughs> and the person only don't argue with them. So next time you, uh, you, you have a, uh, a pork chop, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it probably won't benefit you for health reasons. Right, but uh, it, it it won't affect your soul either. He says so. When you have a person who eats everything, he says don't judge them. And if you have a person who only eats vegetables, he says don't argue with them, because everybody belongs to God. And I want to say that I want to say you belong to God. 
I wish you'd just say that with me. I belong to God. And he's going to show us a little later is that because of the ownership of God in the life of the believer, no one else can give judgment on that person. Right? Uh, the one who is weakest among you has self-imposed rules. And I, I think that in terms of our relationship with the Lord and um, how um, uh, the intimacy of that relationship is not based upon anything that you could do externally in restricting your actions, right? He said, for God has received all of them, whether it's kosher food or non-kosher food, God has received them all. And this alludes to the, uh, the, the, the uh, passage in 1 Corinthians, and uh, we know that uh, part of that conversation was about meat offered to idols, because there was a problem with meat being sold at the market that before it got to the market, it was offered in idolatrous practices. So that they were offering the meat in sacrifice to, to idols and then selling it at the market. And there were those who were of the opinion that, you know, no, I can't eat that meat because they when, that, when they killed it, they offered it up to an idol. And, and really what he says is, whether it was or was not, it will have no bearing on your soul, none on your soul, right? And that you belong to God. Verse, verse 4. Why are you to judge someone else's servant? That, that's verse 4. To their own master. That servant stands or falls. They will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. So, so uh, you know, uh, my wife is an educator, and uh, I heard her and many of her colleagues often talk about the power of the pen. <laughs> if you in, if you are, if you are in in the educatory process, if you're in education or you're in school or you're a student, don't argue with the person who got the power of the pen. Uh, it, it, would, uh, it would be in your best interest to make sure that you have a working relationship with anybody who, uh, who's your teacher. <laughs> because when it all comes down, they have the power of the pen. And I'm talking about grading here. And so it is with God. He says, who are, who are you to judge? Because God is that person's judge, all uh, right? That God is the one who makes the final determination on our grade as it relates to our relationship with him. Nobody else can. So if you find a person who only eats vegetables, he says, uh, don't argue with them. You find a person who eats everything, don't judge them. Because a servant stands or falls, right, to his master. And there's only one Lord and one master. You know, we have a tendency to judge one another. We have a tendency to judge one another. We have a tendency to be critical without relating. I think that's judgment. <clears throat> that you have assessed and you have developed your own opinions and criticisms and bias against a person and you ha you can't even relate. You don't even understand what they're going through. And I want to speak that word to us. <clears throat> that when you see people in a certain condition... Uh, be careful about your judgments and criticism and evaluations uh, when you don't know the circumstances. And, and we don't know why people experience what they experience. And a lot of times, a lot of times, we, we weaken our witness for God, right, because of our attitudes and the way we handle each other. We don't, we don't, give, we don't give people a chance. You know, we don't give people a chance. Uh, it is it is said that Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, was asked, "What is the greatest uh, obstacle for Christianity invading India? What is the greatest obstacle?" And his response was, "Christians, Christians said Christianity could invade India." And more Indians, right, 
could be won to Christ and the way of Christ if it weren't for other Christians. If it was not for the behavior of other Christians. And uh, this is this is powerful. I read I read something. Uh, I'm, I'm a Facebooky, and I, I confess that. Uh, and if you are, you, you all confess it too. At least I'm honest. I, I, I love social media and uh, and all of that. And I observed uh, on my timeline. My kids let me know. My timeline. I deserve, observed that um, there was a post from a guy named Ethan. And I want to read it to you. I want to read it to you. He says, being a servant or a server for the last past three years, I can say without shadow of doubt that the after a church Sunday crowd is filled with the rudest, most self-entitled people to ever walk the earth. Now, I don't know if this brother is a uh, Christian or not a Christian, but his observation in three years of... Uh, of serving uh, as a server in a restaurant. I imagine this is pre-COVID. Uh, but uh, in three years, in observing the after-church Sunday crowd, these people come, come to the restaurant with their suits on, it's obvious they've been to church somewhere. Right? He says that they're, they're the crowd that is the rudest, and most self-entitled people to ever walk the earth. And one of the greatest indictments against our Christian witness and relationship with God, um, it, or even at least our church attendance, is, uh, is, is, is our behavior. <clears throat> our behavior. Uh, my pastor would say often, Dr. William R. Lott, Chicago. He would say so often that people would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And I think that has a lot of uh, validity and power. That our behavioral actions, our actions, uh, and our attitude has a lot to do with whether people want to uh, serve the Christ uh, that's in us. Because if the Christ that in us is not doing us much good, why, why should they follow him? And, and be loyal to him and love him. Okay, so he, he says that the, a servant belongs to another, right? That there's only one master of, of the person who eats everything and the person who eats nothing. So don't judge them and don't argue with them uh, because they belong to one person. That's a master. That's, that's, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, one person considers one day more sacred than the other. And another considers every day a light. Each of them should be fully convinced of in their own mind. You know, this really sets for us that uh, the Christian, we have some uniformity, and that's why we have doctrine, right? We have doctrine. But, uh, you know, we, ha we have uh, teachings in the church. Uh, and a lot of times in church, we are indoctrinated, right, we are literally told what to think and what's right and what's not right because that's what we've been taught. But herein is an opportunity for you to seek and to have clear understanding of God outside of your doctrine. Uh, and let, me, let, me give, let me give an example. There are some, uh, some denominations that, uh, that, that don't use oil. Oil. I mean, it's like taboo. You start talking about oil, uh, for God's sake, don't bring it in the sanctuary because it's taboo oil. But oil is a biblical concept. <laughs> it, it's a biblical concept. It's a biblical concept for refreshing, for grooming, and for medicinal purposes. It's, it's, it's biblical. You know, in James chapter 5, he talks about call for the elders of the church and have them come and pray and lay hands on you and anoint you with oil. That's a biblical concept. So if it's a biblical concept, but it may not be a denominational concept, where do you come down? So there's some things uh, that are in scripture 
that are not prescribed in our dogma or in our doctrine or in our teachings, right? But nonetheless, it's Bible. And this is where I seem to be convinced in your own mind. This is where I see that the believer has not the responsibility. We have the responsibility to continue searching the scriptures uh, then let it inform our uh, theology, our uh, concept of God, right? Thoughts about God, all right? So he says, uh, uh, so what, you know, somebody values one day over another. Others don't value. They value uh, one day over another. Others value all days that are light, right? Uh, whoever eats meat is unto the Lord. He said, give thanks. Give, give thanks. He says, if you're going to uh, uh, eat meat or you're going to eat vegetables, if you're going to eat kosher food or not kosher food, if you're going to eat, uh, if you're going to be a vegan or you're going to, you know, you're gonna, you want that pork chop or lamb chop. He says, uh, <laughs> he says, give thanks to God for it. He says, give uh, thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. And none of us die for ourselves alone. Verse 8. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. It really doesn't matter how long you live, you will not live forever. I said, it doesn't matter how long you live, there will come a day when you will not live forever. And Paul picks this up. First Corinthians, I believe it is chapter five, when he says, uh, if this earthly house of this tabernacle, no, if is always translated since. <laughs> so it's not if in the same sense in which we say if, maybe, or may not. It's really since or when this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved. Tabernacles are tents. And can I pause and tell you that you live in a tent? I understand. I understand. You know, ride your bike, work out eat your vegetables, drink a lot of water, make sure your blood pressure is down, make sure your blood sugar is low, don't have too much salt intake, get your rest, get as much sleep as you can, but you live in a tent. And after a while, the only thing you can do with a tent is patch it up until at some point uh, it can't be patched anymore. And somebody uh, listening to me can testify that the older you get, the more uh, patches you need, <laughs> the more pains and aches, and uh, you can hear your your bones cracking. You know, just just simple movements. You know, you you pull muscles that you didn't even know you had. <laughs> That's because you live in a tent. I live in a tent. And one day, this tent will be dissolved, he says, since this earthly house of this tabernacle will be dissolved, we have a, a building, a building of God not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And that's what's going to happen. What's going to happen despite the food you eat, the food you don't eat, the exercise you do, the exercise you don't do. Uh, the precautions you take, the precautions you do take, the safety measure you have, the safety measure you don't have. Uh, if you live, it's for the Lord. And God forbid, uh, if you die, it's for the Lord. If you live or if you die, it's all for the Lord. And and in the essence, what he's saying is that, that since it is um, it's all for the Lord, he says... Um, you know, don't 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 judge and don't argue with people over the various uh, special days that they have and the special special 
uh, dietary habits that they have. Don't argue with them and don't judge them because uh, they belong to God. So for this reason, Christ died and returned to life or was resurrected so that he might be the, the Lord of both the dead and the living. Christ is no less your Lord whether you are alive or you die. Whether you're sick or whether you're well. This, this really gives us perspective as well on the, uh, the bad things that happen to good people. Right? The, uh, the randomness of trouble and tragedy and sickness. And uh, in many ways, I've heard people say, you know, when people get sick or they have trouble that the Lord trying to get them. No, the Lord ain't getting them back with that. People get sick. Good people get sick. Bad people get sick. Faithful people get sick, you know. Unfaithful people get sick. People who love the Lord and people who don't. But if you belong to the Lord, whether you sick or well, or whether you alive or you die, you belong to the Lord. That's good news. The good news is that nothing, I'm getting happy now, nothing can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Not life or death. Height, right, or depth, right? Angels or principalities, wickedness, high places, none of that stuff. Famine or peril or sword. In all of these things, I'm more than a conqueror. That's Roman 8. <laughs> Nothing can separate me from the love of God. So whether I live or die, whether I'm healthy or I'm not, I belong uh, to the Lord. I belong to God because he is my master. Let's, let's, he talks about these uh, special days, special days. And uh, let me just make a moment that uh, we as Christians, Protestant Christians, we worship on on the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day. Uh, uh, Sabbath is Saturday, right? Uh, and the Sabbath is uh, identified in uh, Exodus 16, and I want to turn to that, and Exodus 20, right? Uh, actually, Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and earth and he spent six days creating. And on that seventh day, Saturday, we call it Saturday, he rested, right? And then we start to circle all over again, cycle all over again uh, with Sunday, right? And uh, I, I want to go back to this because you ought to have a Sabbath. You ought to have a day of rest. You ought to have where well, you cut it all off, you shut it all down, you, you reserve that time to get some rest. And let me tell you, many times uh, the, uh, our impatience, right? Anxiousness, anger, frustration is not because as a part of our character and temperament, it's because what? We tired. Irritability. Tired. Don't want nobody to ask you that. Don't want nobody to tired. And, and part of our well-being, right? He's not saying that Saturday has to be your day of rest because some people work on Saturday. Right? Some people work on Saturday. Some people work on Sunday. So, so Sunday is not a day of rest, it's a day of worship because it's the Lord's day, right? But out of the seven days you have, you ought to have one day where you get some rest. You can't keep working on, so, okay, let's turn. Um, a day of, uh, of recall, rest, and remembrance. I'm turning to Exodus uh, 16. I might be going a little quick here, but Exodus 16, you need a, a day of rest, uh, recall, uh, and remembrance. 16. All right. Uh, 
verse 23 says, Tomorrow is the day of the Sabbath, the Holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil and save what is left until in the morning. But I want to make a reference to this in chapter 16. It's this whole passage about uh, manna. Manna. Manna uh, is, is not bread, but it's like bread. It, it's, it's really, what is this? Hmm. What is this? And uh, it's a reference to manna because when the manna fell in the wilderness, uh, God fed the people of God every day. Every day. Every day, uh, he fed them. Six days, they were to go out and collect what had fallen. That's why it fell, uh, help me say, every day, right? Every day, they went out and they got and collected uh, the manna that fell. And then on the sixth day, they were to collect double, right? So five days, they collect every day. The sixth day, they collect double and... They were only to take what they needed because on the seventh day, no manna would fall. So he wanted them to collect it every day, right? Because on the seventh, no, uh, no uh, manna would fall because that was the day of rest. No work. Working, you're going to go out for five days. On the sixth day, you're going to go out as well. You're going to collect double. But on that seventh day, I want you to rest. I don't want you to work. I don't want you to go out and gather what has fallen from the sky. You know how it is. You know, some of the people say, I'm going to get all I can while I can. And they gathered six days. And then some of them uh, tried to save it over. Right? They, they gathered and then they tried to save it over and ended up uh, getting maggots in their manner. I wish I could speak a word to us as believers as it relates to ordering our world. Uh, Chuck, Chuck Swindoll, I believe, had a book out in the 80s called Ordering Our Private World or something like that. That, that we have to bring order and structure to our world it will help with our temperament with others. It will help with our patience with others. It will help with our understanding. Even wanting to hear somebody else. If we could just get some rest. If we can just get some rest. Right? And God says I want you to rest. Because I want you to know that I can handle your career. I can handle your job. I can handle your work. I can handle your family. I can handle your uh, income. I can supply all of your needs. And that one day that you are doing over extra double time, he says, I want you to take a day and I want you to rest. They had the Sabbath day as a day of rest. So my question is, what is your day? Or do all your days look the same? What is the one day that you shut it all down, cut it all off, you insert in your vocabulary the word no, can't do it today, I'm resting today, I'm spending time with my children today, spending time with my spouse today, I can't come, can't go, can't do it today, what is the one day that you set aside for some rest, and the reason why he sets this is that there ought to be a rhythm of work and rest. So six days, I want you to go out and I want you to get the manna. On the seventh day, ain't no manna going to fall. I don't want you to try to save none. Because it is the Sabbath day, uh, and you ought to keep it holy. And in Israel, their rest was from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, Right? That day started in the evening, started uh, at 6 to 6, right? Um, so I want you to incorporate that. And then I want you to know that God has led. So I'm, I'm talking about these special days, observance of days. You're not locked in to rest on Saturday. You're not locked in to just worship on Sunday. Every day is a day of Thanksgiving. Every day you ought to give him glory. Every day. 
you ought to tell the Lord, I really appreciate you. My life, my, what my life would be like if you were not in my life. Every day. So you're not locked in to Sunday. You locked in every day. Well, let me give an example about observing days over days. You know, and uh, many of you probably can un uh, understand this. Days over days has everything to do with uh, uh, certain things people say. Oh, do you know, don't do that because it's Sunday. You know, they uh, they they'll they'll keep on talking about what's going on on Saturday, Monday, but not Sunday. Right? Not Sunday. So, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm gonna wear Sunday. Well, I ain't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm not gonna, um, uh, uh, I'm not gonna use any profane words. I ain't gonna, you know, oh, that's Sunday now. You know, I ain't gonna party on Sunday. Well, if you have a problem with partying on Sunday, you ought to have a problem with partying on Monday. I'm just using that as an example. You know, I think that uh, if you have a celebration, it's worth it. But if you have a problem with something and you restrict, that's what I mean, self-imposed days, self-imposed rules. If you're restrictive on Sunday, that activity, whatever it is, ought to be restrictive on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Because all of those days are holy days. And, and your value for what you do or don't do ought not be restricted to a day. You know, there used to be a time some people didn't watch TV on Sunday. Couldn't wait for Monday, but Sunday they wasn't watching TV. They couldn't go to the movies, couldn't go skating. When you was a kid, couldn't ride your bike. Because there was something in the minds of, of some foreparents, some parents, that, that Sunday was, was a special day and holy, but every day is holy. And whether your day of rest is Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever day it is, you ought to have one day where you get some rest. And if there's a person who indulges, don't judge them. Don't judge them. And if there's a person who abstains, don't argue with them. A lot of people, and I'm closing right here, uh, a lot of people... Uh, have a tendency uh, to uh, argue with you about your practices and how you live out your life in faithfulness to God, right? Based upon theirs. You know? If you abstain, you belong to the Lord. If you indulge, you belong to the Lord. You eat only vegetables, God bless you. You're vegan, if you are uh, on a keto diet, God bless you. But if you if you see somebody eating a smothered pork chop, <laughs> I'm trying to put it where we can get it. You don't have to impose upon them what God said based upon the rules that you've taken upon yourself. Because whether you indulge or whether you abstain, you belong to the Lord. I want I want to leave with that uh, because we get mixed up in a lot of rules and we argue with people. Uh, but I want you to leave with that message that whether you indulge or you, you abstain, at the end of the day, the power of the pen is in the hands of Almighty God. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for your grace that is sufficient, it is enough in every way and every circumstance. And we pray, God, that our loyalty, our commitment and faithfulness to you will be more to you than it is the rules that we, that we impose upon ourselves. We thank you that if we live, we are yours. And if we die, we are yours. So whether we live or die, whether we eat kosher meat or not kosher meat or whether we indulge in eating everything or, or restricting our diet, your word teaches us that we belong to you. We thank you for it now. 
that no matter what state we find ourselves in, we are yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. See you next week. You've been listening to the online services of Matthew's Memorial Baptist Church, located 2616 Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, Southeast Washington, D.C., under the leadership of Senior Pastor, Reverend Dr. Joseph D. Turner. We encourage you to partner with us through giving. Visit www.mmbcdc.org or text the word GIVE to 301-895-7889 or by mail addressed 2616 Martin Luther King Avenue, Southeast, Washington, D.C., 20020. May God bless you.